Good morning, church family. Man, it is a good day to be here. Amen? Amen. Uh, my name's Kale. I'm one of the pastors on staff here. I'm just so glad to have you in the house with us this morning. And, um, you know, I enjoy being in, uh, in the presence of God with you all every week. Uh, every time we step into this room, I'm so blessed to be a part of such an incredible family. Um, but I especially feel it this morning. Um, because I've been gone the past few weeks. I kind of made a little guest appearance last week um, when we, uh, our discipleship school, uh, we were in Columbia for two weeks. And uh, yes, yeah, and so I feel it this morning, having, you know, absence makes the heart grow fonder, they say. And uh, I already loved you a lot. So <laughs> I'm coming in this morning with lots of love in my heart uh, for you. Uh, but like I said, my wife and I have the incredible opportunity of directing our discipleship school. And um, we have ended, yes, exactly. And um, uh, we just got back last Friday uh, from spending two weeks in Columbia with them. I think we have a picture of us coming up. Yeah, man. Don't we look so good? So nice. Um, yeah, so that's us, 37 students. Uh, the discipleship school, for those of you who don't know, is a nine month discipleship intensive. Um, and at the end of the year, we take a trip overseas. And so, um, yeah, we packed up all 37 students. And then uh, we decided to throw in another 24 leaders and kids uh, because why not? And um, we all 61 of us went together to Columbia for a few weeks and uh, it was incredible. We had an amazing, incredible time. And I actually wanna start this morning just by sharing a few testimonies from our trip. Is that okay? Okay, that's kind of a rhetorical question, but I knew, I knew you would say yes. Um, we saw God do some incredible, amazing things. And I just wanna testify some of those to some of those this morning, and then I'll tie it into what I believe God has for us today. So the first one is, I think we have a picture coming up here. This is Irene and uh, uh, my wife, Allie, and our two kids. Uh, we met Irene um, on our way walking to lunch one day. And um, Irene was a beautiful lady. Uh, we stopped and talked with her for a while. Uh, we had a chance to pray with her and just share that Jesus loves her. Uh, she had a, that mask uh, was covering her face and uh, she had no teeth. And uh, when we got done praying with her, we said, hey, Irene, we would love to take a picture with you so we can remember when we go back home in the States, we'd love to remember you by, by your face and by your name so we can pray for you. And so she said, absolutely, you can take my picture, but um, so I'm sorry about my ugly face. And very quickly, I said, Irene, absolutely not. Um, you are beautiful. You are created in the image of God. And so we just got an opportunity to love on this amazing woman, um, to pray for her and bless her. When we got done, she said, this was the best part of my day. No, 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 week. No, no, no. this is the best part of my whole year. Um, and it was just a beautiful encounter, just on our way to lunch, being able to stop just like Jesus would and meet someone face to face and tell them that they were created in the image of God. So we love Irene and we're still praying for her. We got another one. Okay, so this one will uh, take some explaining. Uh, so this is Leonardo and uh, our translator is to the left. Um, she's talking with Leonardo who some of our students met on a bus. Um, every day we would go out and do some different types of creative evangelism. This day, our students were going out on a bus proclaiming the gospel, uh, which was really fun. And um, our students were out there on a bus um, proclaiming the gospel. And on the other side of the bus uh, was Leonardo. And Leonardo was not proclaiming the gospel. He had a little um, speaker thing right here with a microphone and he was speaking out against Christians. Uh, come to find that Leonardo um, was a Christian, had been a believer, but had become so angry with the political landscape of Colombia and had blamed it on Christians that he had walked away from the faith. And so with anger in his heart, he was on the same bus proclaiming a very different message from our students. And long story short, um, one of our translators went over there and struck up a conversation with him. I don't know if you can tell from the picture, but Leonardo does not look very interested in this conversation. 
Um, but through um, this conversation um, and our translator speaking with him uh, several different times throughout, some of the students said that it was getting pretty intense. They were actually kind of fearful at some times. You know, the translator was pointing at him and he was pointing back at her and there was just this kind of intense moment um, going on in the bus. Uh, long story short, let's go to the next picture. They got a chance to pray over Leonardo, uh, who recommitted his life to Jesus that day. Yeah. Incredible. Um, they said that throughout this conversation, it, it almost felt like something changed in his whole countenance and demeanor. And the anger that he once had in his heart was gone. And that peace was there as they were talking with him. So backstory to this is our team split up into different parts of the city um, each day. And so I wasn't a part of this team. I knew nothing about this testimony. They invited Leonardo to a worship night that we were having that evening that was going to be with some of the local leaders and pastors. And so Leonardo came. I was up front in uh, facilitating kind of a moment. And uh, at different times throughout the night, there was a gentleman about two rows behind uh, who was just really excited. And he interrupted a few times with an amen and a hands raised and he's just on fire for Jesus. And I'm like, man, this guy is, he must be one of their missionaries. He must be one of their staff. Come to find out later, it was Leonardo himself. Um, just on fire for the Lord, having encountered God in a fresh way through our students. Um, such an amazing testimony. And so you can continue to pray for Leonardo. And then the last one. So on this day, um, we went to kind of like a little square um, and just out in this big plaza. And uh, we're doing some other creative evangelism, uh, just trying to engage in conversation with people. Uh, anyone who could talk with us, we would talk with them about anything. And then we would talk about Jesus and share love, share the love of God with them. And so on this day, after being there for a while, um, towards the end of when we were about ready to leave, one of our students noticed a guy uh, walking with a crutch. He had a bandage around his knee and was walking with a crutch. And so they go, uh, him and Adam had gone over to pray with him. And I kind of saw him over there and I was like, I want to know what this is about. So I went over there and uh, long story short, again, uh, just through prayer, had a chance to pray for this man uh, who after praying just our little tiny mustard seed prayers of God, would you come and would you meet this man here on this day in Columbia? He began to test out his knee and he could move it. And we're like, wow, praise God, this is incredible. And even some of our people were like, are you sure? Like, test it again. Like, you don't have to like, you don't have to pretend. Like, I know we're Americans, but like, we, we just want God to touch you and heal you. And so they were able to pray for him. And sure enough, he was able to test it out again and, and, and stand on it. And as we watched him walk away, uh, we got to snap this photo of him walking away with his crutch and you can't really see it, but he, he would walk straight and kind of hang a left and we would watch him walk the whole way out of this plaza completely without his crutch, um, just walking in the, in the healing and freedom that he had received from God that day. Yeah. And I just, this is a great intro, right? Like this is the God we serve. This is who he is. This is why we gather. This is why we come. This is the God we serve. These names of God that we've been studying these past few weeks and will continue all summer long are not meant to just be some like feel good chicken soup for the soul. This is a real God. He's a healing, powerful God. These names of God are testifying to his character and his nature, the character and nature of a very beautiful, holy, and amazing God that we serve. Amen? We aren't doing this series this summer just because it was a good idea or just to learn some cool names of God and kind of storm up in our heart as a summer series scrapbook. That's not why we are here. That's not why we take the time to go through these things. Our prayer is that as you receive the revelation of God each week of who he is through these names, that you in turn would be empowered and compelled to then give that revelation to the hurting and broken world all around you. To the people that you walk by day in and day out here in the States and even to those who are around the world. And so I just wanted to take a minute to pray for us this morning. 
And I hope that even just some of those testimonies already put a deposit of faith in your heart this morning to go, that is the God that we serve. And we're here today to learn even more about him because believe me, every time we look at him, he becomes more and more beautiful. He becomes more and more glorious. And so as we look to him today, can we just, can everyone put their hands on their hearts? And as we look to God today again to study another name, can we just pray that it would be more than words? Can we pray that there would be a a fresh revelation of the divine character and nature of who God is deposited right here, deep in our hearts? Not just in our minds, not just some cool notes that we take and then go out to lunch, but deep within us. And would it change and transform how we live? And maybe even today as you go out to lunch, transform the people around you. That's our prayer. That's my prayer for you today. So let's pray together. God, we are here for you. There's no other reason. You are so beautiful and holy and real. You're moving all across the earth in beautiful ways. And we're asking today, this morning, in this room, God, you would move powerfully in and among your people. And that as we look at these names of God, your names, the names that describe who you are, we're asking God that you would would reveal yourself to us. Maybe in some truths that we've heard a hundred times, but today, the hundred and first time, would it be so real and fresh in us again? Come and do what only you can do today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, we're going to be continue, uh, continuing on by looking at, at another name of God, El Roi. Everyone say El Roi. The God who sees. The God who sees. It comes from the story of Hagar found in Genesis 16. You can turn there in your Bibles if you'd like. And we're going to read through the whole chapter this morning, but we're going to do it by kind of breaking it up into two different mini sections, if you will. We'll move through the first section pretty quickly just to give us some context for what's going on uh, in this chapter before we land in the second section, which is where we'll kind of camp out for the rest of our time today. So Genesis 16, 1 through 6. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go in to my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And she went into Hagar, and he went in to Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. And gave my servant, I gave my servant to your to your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her and she fled from her. So there's a lot going on in just a few short verses. Let me unpack it for us. So first we have Abram and Sarai, later to become Abraham and Sarah. You might remember them from Genesis 12, when God gave Abram a promise to have many descendants. Here now in chapter 16, it's about 10 years since that promise. Abram is now 75 years old, his wife Sarai just 10 years younger. And the slow but steady impatience that has been brewing under the surface has boiled over. Anyone got a promise from the Lord and 10 minutes later, you're like, where is it? We live in that culture it's hard for us to wait thing for, for things. And for Abram and Sarai, it was no different. And so in order to help God, Sarai hatches a plan and resorts to a popular custom of the day. She gives her Egyptian servant Hagar 
to her husband and Hagar becomes pregnant and conceives. Now to no surprise, dissension quickly arises in Abram's household. Sarai, now riddled with jealousy, begins to mistreat Hagar, who eventually runs away into the desert. Two frustrated heroes of faith, one alone and mistreated servant on the run. This is the scene now that we enter into starting in verse seven. This is Genesis 16, seven through 16. The angel of the Lord found her, Hagar, by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I'm fleeing from my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So she called the name of the, of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of seeing. For she said, truly, I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore, the well was called Be'er Lahai Roi. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram, Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. So alone in the desert, Hagar encounters God in such a way that it changes everything for her. It's actually so marking that it, she becomes the first woman and actually first person in all of scripture to give God a name. She calls him El Royi, the God who sees. She says in verse 13, truly here I have seen him who looks after me. Or as another translation puts it, I have now seen the one who sees me. Isn't that beautiful? I have now seen the one who sees me. And this amazing encounter begins when Hagar meets with the angel of the Lord. Now we don't have time to unpack all of this today. I really wish we did because this has been blowing my mind. But many scholars believe that this angel of the Lord is actually the pre-incarnate Jesus. A theophany, a visible manifestation of God to humankind, or in this case, to a servant girl named Hagar. And so here in Genesis 16, this is not just a mere spiritual impression or voice in the wind, but the physical, tangible presence of Jesus speaking with Hagar as one person speaks to another. Isn't that incredible? This was a spectacular moment with God for Hagar in an unbelievably unfavorable set of circumstances. She was alone, hopeless, weary, and in great despair. Scripture tells us she was on her way to Shur, which would have meant she was basically just heading back home to Egypt. Out of options, not knowing, not knowing where else to go, she just decides, I'm just going to head back on my way home to Egypt. Shur, by the way, means wall. And so in some ways, Hagar found herself that day out of options, low on hope, and heading right towards a wall. Has anyone felt that way before? You're like, I don't know where I'm going, what I'm doing. There's a wall in front of me, but I have nowhere else to go. So I'm just gonna keep going and hope for the best. That's where Hagar is on this day. And that's why verse seven cuts so beautifully through this seemingly dark narrative with such brilliant light. Genesis 16, seven the angel of the Lord found her. The angel of the Lord found her. I mean, can you feel the shift in the story? Can you feel it this morning? Can you see the difference that the presence of God makes? How everything changes when Jesus walks into the messes we find ourselves in. 
And I believe that this simple, remarkable sentence was the gateway to three distinct revelations about the God who sees that Hagar received that day. And my hope for us this morning as we kind of walk through these one by one is that we too ourselves would receive them afresh in our hearts. The first is this, that the God who sees is real. The God who sees is real. This may sound like an oversimplification to you and I, but to Hagar, it was everything. God revealed himself to be unlike the other gods that Hagar knew and had grown up around. Remember, Hagar was Egyptian. The Egyptians were believed to have worshiped thousands of gods. Only about 1,500 to 2,000 are even, uh, do we even kind of know about today as we've studied them. These gods all had unique names, individual personalities and characteristics. They wore different kinds of clothing, held different objects in their hands. Oh, I lost my spot in my notes. I'm sorry, y'all. Fifteen hundred to two thousand. <laughs> Can you believe it? Insane. They wore all different kinds of clothing, held different objects as sacred, and presided over their own certain domains of influence. Hagar would have been familiar with all of this, and also the empty rituals that they would have used to worship these gods. And that's why Hagar's encounter with Jesus that day was unlike anything she had ever heard of or known. Psalm 15 paints a beautifully vivid picture of the gods that Hagar would have been familiar with. This is Psalm 115, four through eight. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but do not speak. Eyes, but do not see. They have ears, but do not hear. Noses, but do not smell. They have hands, but do not feel. Feet, but do not walk. And they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. The reality that God actually saw Hagar that day come crashing into her world. This was unlike the gods she knew and had heard about. This was real. There was a, a God with a mouth who could speak and it spoke her name. There was a God with feet who could walk and he was standing in front of her. This was a God with eyes that could actually see and they were looking right at Hagar. And again, I think that this point maybe seems so elementary to many of us today. You know, like God is real, amen. <laughs> I think most of us are gathered here today because we believe that in some way in our hearts, that God is, God is real. But honestly, I think if I were real honest with myself, there's so many days where that glorious truth is not as alive in my heart as it should be. And there's even Sundays where I walk into this room where I'm more focused on my own needs and what I wanna get out of today than the awareness of his very real presence with us. And I want that to change for me. I wanna become someone who is aware of the reality, who lives from that reality that God is real. He's not like the Egyptian gods. He's not like the other things in life that people go to to find hope or healing or peace, but that the God who sees is real. And I don't wanna just think about it. I want to live from that place every moment that I wake up and especially every moment that I step foot into this church with you. I want that for me and I want that for you. I want that for us as a church family so that when we come every week into gatherings like this, we would do so with a holy expectation burning within our hearts because there's no sickness that he can't heal. There's no burden that he can't lift. There's no anxiety that could, he can't still. There's no marriage he can't restore. There's no mountain that he can't move. This is the God that we serve. And he's not just a good idea. He is very real. The God who sees is real. 
And the God who sees is personal. Everyone say personal. This God knew Hagar's name and called out to her. I love that it says the angel of the Lord found her. Hagar wasn't praying to God. She wasn't running to him for help. She wasn't even looking for God. On this day, God came looking for her. And as I was studying this passage, I I couldn't help but think of another story that bears a striking resemblance to this one. It's found in John 4, and it's the story of the woman at the well. We don't have time to go into the full story this morning, but I'm just going to summarize it here quickly for us. Jesus, on his way to Galilee, decides to take the scenic route through Samaria. Classic Jesus. Never in a hurry, but always on time. Much to the surprise of his disciples, because Jews don't associate with Samaritans. Jesus comes to a well where he eventually meets a Samaritan woman. And their brief conversation very quickly turns into a beautiful encounter with the love, grace, and power of God. Does that sound familiar? This is the beauty of the God we serve. Listen, from the beginning, Hagar encounters the pre-incarnate Jesus in Genesis chapter 16. And then some 2,000 years later in John 4, that same Jesus, now living and walking in the flesh, shows up at another well, this time to encounter a lonely, broken, and hurting woman from Samaria. Isn't that beautiful? That's the God we serve. From the very beginning of Genesis to the gospel of John, the eyes of the Lord have been on his people. And his heart has been to encounter them, to reveal his love and his beauty and his nature to them personally. God sees you today. He saw you before you were you. I love this passage from Psalm 139. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are also there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night. Listen to this. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my, num- in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance in your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me when as yet there was none of them. This is the God who sees. He is real and he is personal. And he is coming after you today. He wants to meet with you today. God sees you today. I love this quote by the famous Charles Spurgeon. He says, remember church that you are not unregarded. You do not pass through this world in unseen obscurity. And I just, I felt the heart of God for us this morning to just speak that out over us that, listen, you are not unregarded today. In a room this size, I'd venture to believe that some of us this morning might feel that. And I don't want to dismiss that and pretend that it's not there. But in the midst of that loneliness, there is a God this morning who very much sees you. 
you are not unregarded. You may be facing hardship or pain or uncertainty, but you are certainly not unseen. The God who sees is real. The God who sees is personal. And finally, the God who sees is close. The God who sees is close. As I was praying um, this week, I kind of got a picture in my mind. And I saw Jesus in my mind, and he was in this room. And he was walking out among the aisles. He wasn't up there preaching, although that would be awesome. He was out here. And I saw him kind of walk up the different aisles. I saw him kind of step over people awkwardly. But as he was walking, he was looking at people in, in their eyes. And he was locking eyes with people. And just like the woman at the well or Hagar that day, as he locked eyes with people in an instant, they knew that God saw them. Like in this beautiful encounter, it was like, make no mistake, this thing is not just like a, this is real, this is Jesus and he's looking at me. Everything else, you know, you just kind of like, everything else falls silent. And I saw him just walking around the room and he was looking, he was looking across the room, he was making eye contact with people. And I was trying to figure out how to illustrate this this morning. And I was like, I don't, I don't want us just to hear this message today. I want you to feel it. Can you feel the difference? Of, some of you are like awkward right now. You're feeling awkward. It feels, doesn't closeness feel awkward sometimes? You're like, whoa, this is getting real. I, I amen to when he was up there, but now he's like walking out here. This feels real. Do you feel it this morning? I want you to feel it because there is a God who is real and he's here and he's walking around the room this morning and he's making eye contact with you. And as he does, there's something that's coming alive in your heart and you know this morning and some of you, it may be the first time this morning where you feel it, where you go, God is real. I mean, I've like heard about it and like good, good Bible stuff, but like, but he's actually real. And I think sometimes we, there's a gap, you know, like I just want to close church. Can you hear me? I want to close the gap this morning. And it's all throughout scripture. We could unpack it for another hour if we wanted to, but I believe that there's something of the spirit this morning that only his work can do that. He's wanting to look across this room. He's wanting to look you in the eye and he's wanting to say, I see you. I saw you before you were you. I know everything about you and I'm here to love you. I think of the story of Zacchaeus. You know, God, this seeing God that we serve, he's not comfortable with just seeing you at a distance. In a crowded street that day, he looks up and sees Zacchaeus in a tree a man who is desperate to see God. And he looks at him and he says, Zacchaeus, he calls him by name. He says, come down from that tree. I'm going to your house today. God is here in this room and he doesn't wanna just make a glance at you. Listen, he wants to come and he wants to sit down next to you. What's up, man? He wants to sit with you. Can you feel the love of God for you today? It's been my prayer all week that it would actually become real to you. That God, you would feel him right. Do you feel me sitting next to you? <laughs> that you would feel it. A God who's not just interested at like, watching you come and go on a Sunday morning every week. That's not your God. The God we serve knows you by name and he's stepping out from whatever distance you've put within him today and he's wanting to step out and sit next to you. Each one of you. 
he sees you and he loves you today. He's a God that's close. I love that he tells Zacchaeus, hey, it's great that I saw you, but I'm coming to your house today, Zacchaeus. Hope you cleaned up. I'm coming to your house today and I believe Jesus this morning is walking around this room and he's calling some of you out by name and he's wanting to come to your house today. And he's not just waving goodbye, he's, he's putting his hand on your shoulder. Listen, I don't know about you, I grew up in the church, for whatever reason, this happens in my brain, but we, we, there's a gap, we create this distance. And I just believe that Jesus this morning, he's wanting to close that gap for good. He's like wanting to remove it. And for some of you, you're like, finally, he's up there again. I can breathe. <laughs> <No, I'm kidding. laughs> Listen, do you feel the joy of the Lord this morning? Because here's the other beautiful thing. He's here this morning and he sees you and he's wanting to love you and come near you, but some of you still believe that he's mad at you. Like, I don't want God to come to my house because he's gonna see all this stuff and I just know it, I just know it. He's gonna, he's gonna point out this and point out that. Listen, God, Jesus, he's walking through this room and his, he has kindness towards you. And yeah, there's some stuff that needs to be figured out. That's what walking with Jesus looks like. It'll be taken care of on the way as you go. But listen, there's, there's a gap this morning that I, I truly, I believe this for you, church. I'm not, it's not just an illustration anymore. This is what the spirit of God is wanting to do in this room. He's closing the gap. And the God that you come on a Sunday and hear about, he's wanting to reveal himself to you. And he's wanting to be very, very real. I love this quote that I found by a French author named Paul Claudel. He says, Christ did not come to do away with suffering. He did not come to even explain it. He came to fill it with his presence. And I believe once again in a room this size that there's probably some pain and suffering this morning, some hardships, some difficult circumstances that I don't have the answers to and I don't know. And I don't know if Jesus is gonna come today and just take it away. Maybe he does, we saw him do it on the streets of Columbia. I don't know what his encounter with you is gonna look like today, but I do know this, that he is wanting to come and fill every space with his glorious, beautiful presence. And that's something only he can do. So stand up with me. I believe that in some ways there's a well this morning. There's a well in front of you. Some of you like Hagar might feel like you're running right towards a wall, but there's a well in front of the wall and it's a meeting place with Jesus. And he's calling out to some of you by name and he's saying, I see you and I love you and I don't want you to run away from me. I want you to run to me. His heart is after you from the beginning of time. His heart was to personally commune with you. And so there's a well today and I think the invitation is just to come to that well, wherever you're at. Again, if you're Hagar and you're in the middle of pain and uncertainty, let me just tell you, don't flee back to Egypt. Come to the well of living water. Come and drink. 
Everything else you run to, you're gonna thirst again. But when you taste and see that the Lord is good, something in your heart will be set free. Or maybe some of you are not in the, the worst of circumstances. You've been following Jesus for a long time and maybe you're like me and you just go, man, I, I've been coming on Sunday, staying for a bit and then just leaving just coming and going. And maybe you feel like you've lost the holy expectancy that when we gather, it's to gather to worship a very real God and a very present personal God and a God who wants to come close. And maybe this morning you need to come to the well and just say, God, would you reawaken my heart again with wonder, wonder and awe of your presence. Would you instill within my heart again a holy expectancy to every time I step foot on this campus or walk through those doors, I can't wait to see what you might do. That's my prayer for us as a church. So pray with me this morning. God, we come before you this morning. God, we're desperate for you. Like, where else can we go? And you alone, God, you're the one who brings life. You're the one who brings hope and healing. And, and so we just come before you today. Even right now, you can start coming forward. And just come and take your place at the well this morning. And just say, God, I... I repent for the ways I've lost my holy expectancy. I repent for the ways that I've just kind of been coming and going. And I want on this day, I wanna be able to have on my lips like Hagar, that you are the God who sees me and that you are real. And God, I pray this morning for every broken and hurting heart. And I pray that you would minister to them in ways that only you know how. God, you gave me that picture this week and I believe it's true. You're walking right now up and down the aisles across the room, God. You're jumping over seats just so you could put your hand on someone to tell them that I see you today and I love you and there's nowhere you can flee from my presence. And I'm not mad or disappointed at you, but there's a love for you that your heart has been longing for. And if you would just come and you would sit at the well, you would taste of it and the pain might not go away, it may not be explained, but it will be filled with a beautiful presence. And that presence has a name and his name is Jesus and he's here and he's ministering to hearts today. And so the band is gonna lead us as we just respond to the Lord. And again, I, the invitation is to come and, and find your place at the well. I believe again that God's gonna meet beautifully with people this morning. And I know he does that one-on-one -on -one just from him straight to the hearts of people. I know he does that through his church. He uses his church to love on one another. And so maybe some of you this morning, there's a place for you to go, man, I'm gonna go pray for someone. I'm gonna go love someone. Maybe you just need to go hug someone this morning. God, I thank you for this place and I thank you for your heart. And I thank you that these names of, of you are, they are more than a name. They are divine and holy and they, they act as doorways straight into your heart and your nature. And I pray God for a supernatural strength over every single heart in this room to walk through that doorway, to walk straight up to Jesus, to walk straight up into the Holy of Holies and say, God, I'm here. And I pray God that as hearts across the room do that this morning, that you would encounter them with your love, just like you did Hagar. And I pray for freedom and I pray a release of joy and peace, unlike anything that our hearts have ever felt. Would you come Holy Spirit and do what only you can do in this room as we look to you in Jesus name. Amen.